Uh, hi there. Can everyone hear me? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Uh, good. So, welcome to Comp Nine Triple Four uh, Neural Networks and Deep Learning. So, uh, I'm the lecturer in charge for this course. Uh, just a sec. Live transcription. Uh, so. Uh, can everyone see this uh, window here? So yep. this, uh, all the materials for this course is going to be on this ed platform. I think almost all of you have uh, successfully got onto the platform. Uh, so those of you who had a, uh, you know, you took a course that used ed before, this should be just added to your list of courses. Uh, some of you who hadn't had one before would have got an invitation and then you have to create an account. And some of you may possibly have two different accounts uh, under different email addresses and then you should be able to merge them uh, together. So I think a few people were still sorting this out uh, the last few days, but hopefully everyone should get on board uh, pretty soon. So it's, everything's broken down by weeks. I think I've only made uh, up to week three visible so far, but I'll, I'll make some other weeks visible very soon. And each week I've tried to break into two parts, uh, A and B. And uh, so the idea is that the, we would uh, focus on the A material in the Tuesday session and the B material in the Wednesday session. And these Zoom sessions will be recorded and uh, partially edited, and then the recordings will be posted uh, onto the Ed website within a, within a few days. So just a quick introduction to the course. Uh, this is, so the textbook, um, the text for the course is this book, um, by Goodfellow, Bengio, and Corville, Deep Learning. Uh, I think it's available in the bookshop, but also you can uh, you can access it online for free. Uh, at this website, you, you can't literally get it in PDF format, but it is possible to convert it into PDF format if that's what you want. So that's very good. Uh, the textbook, it's its a good textbook. There are some topics that are covered in a way that's a little bit um, mathematical and the probabilistic, the notation, the probabilistic notation is sometimes uh, a little bit more sophisticated and, and in a style that wasn't quite what I would prefer. But other than that, it's, it's a good, uh, suitable for our purposes. There's going to be some assumed knowledge, linear algebra, probability, and calculus. Uh, the probability I've tried to put everything that's needed uh, into the into the week two module. The calculus and the chain rule you shouldn't have any problem with. The linear algebra we'll be discussing in uh, language processing. We'll be discussing about singular value decomposition. So. You might like to brush up a little bit on the linear algebra um, if you're a bit rusty on that. Uh, now, the uh, this is the planned topics for the course by week, and I've tried to identify relevant sections of the textbook. Uh, you know, so have a look at those if you, if you. I mean, this is mainly as a reference. Uh, probably the material on the website may be. Sufficient. I've also tried to put links to external resources and papers if you get uh, want to find out more about a particular topic. Uh, now, the assessment for the course, there'll be two assignments plus the final exam. Uh, the final exam will be through Moodle. So the only thing we'll be using Moodle for is the sample exam and the final exam. Uh, nothing else, and the uh, the web CMS. Oh, sorry, app assignment one. Uh, so probably assignment one will be due in week six, and assignment two in week nine or ten. Assignment one uh, will be done individually. 
assignment two uh, can be done either individually or in a pair, you know, like a group of two. And the formation of groups for assignment two will be done through web CMS. So again, that'll be the only thing that's done through web CMS. Everything else will be through uh, Moodle. Uh, now for assignment, um, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Elizabeth's asking, does it make much difference whether we use Windows or Linux? It shouldn't make a difference whether you use Windows or Linux. That should be fine. Uh, so I should mention, okay, so the um, we will be using PyTorch for this course. So for the assignments, you'll have to be writing code in PyTorch. For assignment two, you only need a little bit of code and um, then you'll do, be doing some analysis. For assignment two, or you, I should say the assignment one, the, uh, the running of the code won't be particularly um, you know, won't take too long. The assignment two, the, uh, it may take a little bit longer and it, we've just, we're, we're just, we're gonna just, we're designing the assignment so that you can do it all with a CPU. You don't necessarily have to have a GPU, but it may run fast with a GPU. So if you can get a GPU running on your local machine, that's good. Uh, if you, if you, if you don't have a, um, CUDA enabled local machine, we recommend uh, Google Colab. So we got some resource there to, as an introduction to Google Co Colabs. Um, and your assignment will be tested on the CSE machines. Uh, I believe these are the versions of the modules that are currently installed on the CSE machines. So uh, if you've got uh, if you've got later versions of this, it probably should still run okay. But uh, you should be um, you should be checking to see that um, uh, particularly for the second assignment, you should be checking uh, when you submit it. Uh, there'll be some checks to make sure it's compatible with what's installed on uh, on the CSE machines. Now, someone's at our oh, VMware. Yeah, sorry, Qingdang. That's suggesting to Elizabeth, uh, where Windows users, you could use VMware. Yeah, I think that's you could use VMware or Parallels, uh, but I think you can just run the Python natively on Windows. Uh, if you want to, and that should be okay as well. Uh, just, yeah, for Torch, if you can just, if you can start by installing the CPU version, that's good. And then if you manage to get the GPU version installed, that's a bit better. But yeah, I use a Mac. I know I use a MacBook and I, I can't get uh, the GPU to run on my, my laptop, unfortunately. Um, uh, the recording, uh, we it I, probably might not be on YouTube, but it'll be on uh, this uh, thing called the box, um, the box.unsw.edu.au. So it'll be publicly accessible uh, as long as you have the URL, and then I'll put a link to it on the ed uh, on the ed page. Yeah. I mean, the thing, there's quite a few students are in uh, quite, yeah, there's, there's some fair number of students for this course who are in China at the moment, and they may have some difficulty accessing YouTube, which is why we use, uh, we use the box, but it will be publicly accessible. Uh, good, and yeah, just a reminder, um, about plagiarism. So we check all the submissions for plagiarism. So please make sure the work is entirely your own and don't uh, copy anyone else's code or send anyone a copy of your uh, of your code. Uh, yeah, okay, James is asking if there's a way to export the lecture slides from Ed. 
Uh, that's a good point. Uh, okay, I'll check. Uh, oh, triple dot preview session. Uh, okay, wait a sec. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, thanks for that. Gail, Gail Rav's saying uh, you click on this triple dot here and select preview session. And then, okay. Yeah, that's not. Oh, sorry, then you click on download PDF. Yeah, I think that's it. So you click on the triple dot to uh, and preview session, and then you click on download uh, PDF. Uh, and then you should get multiple pages here, yeah. Good, thanks for that. Um, ah, yes, now where are we? Uh, okay, I'll take, try to take these in order. Is it a double pass course? I'm not sure. Uh, there's no hurdle requirement if that's what you're asking. So the uh, for this course, at the end, we just add up all the marks, and if you get more than 50 marks, uh, then you pass the course. So there's no requirement to pass the individual components uh, on their own. It's just, we just added, added it all up. Ah, uh, yes, when the user uploaded to Ed, so I have to do this, um, semi-manually so i export every um yeah i've every few days i export um <laughs> tedious but i expect i export all the uh enrolled students out of sms uh i do a diff to check who's been added and who's been uh deleted and then i uh and then I paste the new students into Ed. So it's something I have to do by hand every few days. So if you've just enrolled yesterday or today, it's possible you may not have access to Ed yet, but it should you should get access um, by the end of today. Ah, uh, the final exam. Oh, okay, good question. Yeah, look, the final exam. Okay, so if I should say, where are we back? Ah, uh, the final exam. Ah, uh, yeah. Sorry, let me say just a little bit more about how these modules are structured. So, ah, uh, yeah. Look, I've gone to some effort, obviously, to um, uh, convert the material from I up before the pandemic or up until last year, I had sort of um, latex slides in with uh, dot points. And I think, I mean, for, if those are probably still accessible from web CMS, if you want to go back and have a look at them, but I've basically taken all that content and converted in, into complete sentences and added proper, um, references and everything so i think pretty much all the material from the that i had on the lecture slides has been uh converted here and then there are videos um yeah so the video if you look at the videos there so these these videos are videos from from 2019 uh that are using the slide format um and I've tr I've made an effort to edit them down into uh, just bite-sized pieces of uh, twelve minutes each or thereabouts. Uh, but the material from the slides is here. You might occasionally see something on a slide 
that isn't uh, in the text, but it would be very, very rare. And if that's the case, that that material wouldn't be examinable. Uh, okay, Are you, is, is my audio becoming glitchy? <laughs> Uh, okay, let me just, uh, my NBN uh, can be a bit dodgy, so I'm, I'm about to try to switch to my phone, so there may be a brief dropout. Just wait here. Uh, okay, is the audio good now? Can you hear me? Yeah, I think it's all right now. Okay, good. <laughs> it shows you what a third world country we're living in that uh, the NBN is so bad that the phone does a better job. Or maybe it shows how great the phone system is. I don't know, one or the other. Uh, where was I? Okay, so we got the, we got the text, we got the images, we got the videos. And then, uh, there's little X, oh, so there's three types of exercises. So there's these sort of exercises here where uh, you have to, uh, you know, do some computation, do, do some calculations by hand and uh, enter them here. Now, the, it is possible to see sample solutions to these straight away. You just have to submit anything and you'll be able to see the sample solution, but we highly recommend that you show some restraint and try to uh, try to solve the question yourself before looking at the sample solution because you'll learn a lot better that way. Yeah, so, you know, have a go at it first. Don't just jump to the solution, but it's there when you need it. And then there are what we call quizzes. Right, that's right. So the exercises are not marked. They're just um, for practice. And then these things that we call quizzes are actually not marked either. They're just for practice. So these are just sort of, you know, to test your memory of the material. That's or your memory and your understanding of the material. Uh, right, so there's exercises, there's quizzes, and then there's what we call coding exercises. So the coding exercises are things where you have to write some now, uh, Py, uh, PyTorch code. And these are also, well, the first one is just Python, but then afterwards, uh, and NumPy, but afterwards PyTorch. These are not graded either. They're just for your education, right? So this, there's, um, exercises, there's quizzes and there's coding exercises. Ah, uh, yes, so this coding, the answers to the coding exercises will be provided, uh, but not immediately. So they'll probably be provided a week later, something like that. It'll be the solution we made visible. Uh, so this started with someone was asking a question about the exam, right? So on the exam, uh, basically, the quizzes and the exercises give you a good uh, impression of what kind of questions to expect on the exam. So the exam will be really testing the theory rather than the coding. Uh, so you won't have to uh, you won't have to write any Python code in the exam. Uh, so, but you'll have to you'll have to write Python code in the assignments, obviously. So the idea is that the assignments will test your Python coding, so we won't don't need to test it in the exam. And so again, yeah, these coding exercises are mainly uh, to help you get started with PyTorch, uh, so that you can do the assignments and the. Um, the coding exercises, yeah, that's right. That's the purpose that they serve. And there's going to be, a, uh, I think there's a six, five, I can't remember, five or six coding exercises altogether. Some of them are in the weeks after the assignment is released, obviously. So I think the last coding exercise is to do with autoencoders, but it, yeah, it's quite an interesting 
topic. So, um, yeah, I think you should do that anyway, just for your um, your own <laughs> interest. Ah, oh, yes. Will it be a tutorial? Good question. So uh, there won't be sort of, uh, but it, well, not exactly tutorials, but what there will be is online, uh, effectively online lab consultations. They'll begin in week two. Uh, I'll post a, um, and they'll be done by Zoom as well. Uh, I'll post as soon as that's, uh, we're just sorting that out now, the times and the Zoom links. And as soon as it's ready, I'll post a notice on the Ed website. Um, we think that the sessions will be Monday two to four, Wednesday two to four, and then um, there'll be sessions on Thursday uh, and possibly Friday. Uh, and there might be, um, uh, it's probably, uh, two or three sessions is it starting in week two and then we it's possible we may add another session uh later in the term yeah so this these are they're not compulsory uh it'll be two or th probably three two hour sessions per week and you just it's you just you show up to the zoom session and ask questions uh if you need to and i imagine um uh, they're mainly, I guess the main purpose is to help you with the with the coding and the assignments. I imagine in week two, uh, some people may need help with installing the um, uh, Python and the right modules on their system and that kind of thing. So the tutors can help you with that. Good. So where were we? Oh, yeah, so the, the the material for today is just, um, yes, uh, I think that uh, the co weekly coding exercises and labs um, and the, uh, and the, and the, you know, the theoretical material should, should, should be enough to get you uh, through the assignments. Yeah, that's right. Um, Yeah, so this first module is just uh, actually, well, first of all, we've provided a little bit of background <laughs> material uh, about, um, about the brain and the structure of neurons and ion channels. This material isn't really examinable. It's just this particular uh, slide here, but it's just, um, provide some interesting background. I'm just curious, did anyone, um, did anyone identify what, uh, what, what animal this is? A dog, <laughs> that's right, the Dalmatian, yeah, yeah. Good, so the dog, if any of you can't see it, uh, if you can, I think, can you see my cursor here? The, 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 um, the face of the dog is in the, exactly in the middle and it's kind of sniffing. The dog is facing away from us. And uh, that's its face, that's its nose, that's its ear. This is its front legs and that's its back legs. Now, interestingly, uh, People from certain African countries, when they're shown this, they say they see a hyena. And when they're asked where the hyena is, they say that the, this, the dog becomes the hyena, but the, the hyena is facing towards us. So this here is the face of the eye hyena. That's its eyes, that's its ears, and this is its mouth. The back legs of the dog become the front legs of the hyena and vice versa. So this is quite interesting because it shows the way that our perception is, uh, well, all perception is theory laid. And as uh, <laughs> I think Fodor said or whatever, but yeah, so our perception is based on 
what kind of animals we're used to dealing with. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so have a look at this neuroanatomy stuff. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, the ion channels. And then this, this is links to two different uh, <laughs> histories of deep learning, which are quite uh, interesting too. So then we get to the real material of the course. So this is a structure of a biological neuron. Uh, this is a very, very nice picture from Wiki Commons. Uh, it's a slightly untypical, not all, most neurons don't have this myelinated sheath. That's something that's specific to motor neurons. Uh, but I keep looking for a better picture of a neuron and I never find one. So we're, we're stuck with this. So, but neurons have uh, yeah cell body and then they have dendrites and, and axon and synapses. So then this kind of mathematical model of, um, of a neuro, you know, the simplified mathematical model that McCulloch and Pitts came up with where uh, basically you have a bunch of inputs and you, you make a linear combination of the inputs plus a constant and then if it's and then you put it through a transfer function and you get the output and the original the original transfer function they had was this uh, step function yeah so if it's if the if that linear combination is below a th threshold then the output is zero and otherwise it's one, right? Later on, they replaced it with some other transfer functions that we'll talk about later, but that's that's the kind of uh, McCulloch and Pitts neuron. And then this Frank Rosenblatt uh, came up with this method of learning the weights uh, for this, uh, uh, for this, um, Uh, near which he called a perceptron, and uh, yeah, so there's there's uh, well, in two dimensions, we can just kind of do it by hand, we can draw a line and figure out uh, the weights and the biases, which is an interesting exercise. But um, uh, Rosenblatt showed this way that you can like automatically learn. Uh, the weights for this perceptron. So I've got this example here of the perceptron learning algorithm. And then, yeah, so have a look at those videos and then try to work through this uh, exercise. Yeah. Uh, oh, you enrolled yesterday. Look at, I think it depends what time of day you enrolled, but I'll try to. This afternoon or this evening, I'll, I'll try to update and add anyone who's, who's newly enrolled. Uh, where are we? Yeah, does anyone have any questions about uh, this material? Ah, uh, yes, the class, is class synonymous with actual out? Yes, I think so. Ah, oh, yes, okay. Uh, Hugh's asking whether class is synonymous with actual output. Ah, uh, oh, this is okay. Ah, uh, not exact. Ah, oh, okay. So the actual output, right. Good question. So the action, if you if we use this uh, uh, if we were to use the sine is sine function s i g n then it would be yes. But actually, I guess traditionally uh, these traditionally we normally use this. Uh, well, it's traditional to have the output be zero or one rather than minus one or one. So 
I should have maybe edited the, I, I think maybe I should have said positive and negative rather than minus one and plus one. But um, if the class is minus one, that means that the linear combination should be negative before it goes through the transfer function. So then after the transfer function, it would be zero. And then if the class is plus one, Uh, it should be positive before it goes to the transfer function and then plus one. So I apologize, there's a slight uh, clash of uh, conventions here, whether, whether the, yeah, the ne positive and negative class is whether it's like plus one and minus one or plus one and zero, but the, the, uh, the learning algorithm uh, happens in the same way. Uh, Uh, okay, how can we draw drive the threshold line equation directly? I should have uh, So Felix, could you explain that a little bit more? You've been given x one and x two. Oh, yes, yeah. so the idea you're asking about the perceptron. So, the idea of the perceptron learning algorithm is uh, basically the idea is this that x, you're given a particular example of x1 and x, you're given a particular example of x1 and x2. And, uh, and you're told whether it's positive or negative example. So, you can compute this sum and you just check whether it's positive or negative. So if it's negative, you do something, and if it's negative and it should have been positive, then you do something and bake it bigger. And if it's positive and should have been negative, you do something to make it smaller. <laughs> so the way we make it smaller, well, if we, if we increase W zero, that'll make S bigger. And if we decrease W zero, that'll make S smaller. And then here, if we add a multiple of xi to wi, that will make s bigger. And if we subtract a multiple of xi from wi, that will make it smaller because xi could be positive or negative. That's basically what the idea that's going on here. Ah, uh, the class, yeah, so that's a good question. Okay, so the perceptron is only designed for two class. The perceptron really, only works for a two class classification problem. So, in the, I don't know, this was, uh, I think I mentioned this in the video, but maybe not in the text that if you, uh, so this, uh, you can see from this image that the the task, one of the main, the probably the, one of the main tasks that uh, Rosenblatt was concerned with was this <laughs> uh, let character recognition uh, test. Like it's very obviously it's highly simplified here. You've just you have to have a very normal looking uh, printed character, not a handwritten one, and so on. But um, if you, in order to learn this, so we're gonna, get, you know, as the course progresses, we'll see this is essentially the same as the MNIST task, right? Except with 26 characters instead of 10. So we'll see other ways to do this with more modern techniques. But if you're gonna do this with a perceptron, you actually need uh, 26 different perceptrons because the perceptron only does a binary classification. So you have one perceptron that tells you whether it's A or not A, one that tells you whether it's B or not B. So each perceptron just separates off one class from the other 25 classes. And then after the whole thing is trained, uh, I suppose you would just take the biggest um, 
hopefully when you put a letter in, just uh, hopefully only one output will be one and the others will be will be positive and the others will be negative. But um, if if multiple of them are positive, then you would probably just try to pick the one with the biggest, uh, that has the biggest activation before uh, going through the activation function. Yeah, use some, uh, some, some heuristic like that to decide which, which letter to pick. Uh, yeah, so here the, um, so in this case, there'd be 26, classes in the overall task, but for e each individual perceptron uh, is just separating two classes. A yeah, good question. And uh, I think the, oh, okay. Yes, good question. Will it will it will it converge with any learning rate if the samples are linearly separable? That's right. Uh, so this is it does. So this is the thing with the learning rate. It's if you are uh, so later on uh, when we get to back propagation. The value of the learning rate will be import, very important. If the you know if the learning rate's too small, the learning will be very slow, and if the learning rate's too big, the learning will become unstable. But for the perceptron, and it, interestingly, for the perceptron, it doesn't really matter too much how big the learning rate is. If the learning rate is zero point one or one or ten, the algorithm works in almost the same way and takes roughly the same number of steps to learn the data. So this, this was, uh, this was Rosenblatt's contribution. He proved that regardless of the learning rate, uh, it, it will learn the data successfully. Yeah, so it's a, this perceptron learning algorithm is a bit unusual. Uh, it's a bit un different from the other algorithms uh, from that point of view but it's interesting from a historical uh, perspective. Uh, so I'll just give you a quick summary of what, you know, what we'll talk about tomorrow. Uh, so we look at multi-layer, so we look at multi-layer perceptron, we're gonna look at multi-layer perceptrons. So you put, you know, perceptrons together in a network, and that allows you to learn more, a bigger variety of functions, functions that aren't linearly separable. And then this is a very useful exercise for you to go through. So it turns out that uh, if, you, if, if I write down any logical expression, it's possible to build a two layer neural network that will implement that logical uh, function. Yeah, so because if you take in, there's a, there is a procedure, if you take any logical expression, there's a procedure that converts it into what's called conjunctive normal form. And then once it's in conjunctive normal form, you can you can build up a, a two layer neural network. So yeah, have, have a go at this exercise because that's quite um, edifying. And then, yeah, we'll look at uh, gradient descent and um, back propagation and, and a few other um, related issues. Yeah. So that's, that'll be for tomorrow, yeah. Good, okay. So anyone have any questions about uh, this lesson or about organization of the course. <laughs> Whose dog is that? <laughs> That's very good.
Oh, okay, it's fine, George. Ah, oh, okay, where are we? Oh, okay, let me just uh, take these. Okay, TensorFlow. Ah, oh, yes, look, someone. Um, okay, yeah, if you're still having trouble with Ed, uh, try to merge the accounts. Uh, if, you, if you're still having trouble, you can email me. I'll see what I can uh, do about it. Uh, so May is asking about TensorFlow. Um, oh, sorry, let me take this in a slightly different order. Oh yeah, Rocky's asking whether 1A is done. The thing is, uh, okay, I'm expecting you to read through the material. Um, this isn't, these sessions are not really gonna be an online lecture. I'm not gonna cover all the details. I'm just gonna, in future sessions, I'm just gonna give a quick summary of the material to remind you, but you, you're expected to read through the material and watch the videos um beforehand there's only you know there's for each for each lesson there's like you know there's certainly less than an hour of video it's i've tried to make them as short as possible so um you're supposed to watch the videos and read the material beforehand and then ask and ask you know in the, in the session i'll just give a brief summary and then take questions um Okay, the TensorFlow. Yes, you should read the contents before uh, before the session. That's right. Yeah, try to read the A contents before the Tuesday session and the B uh, before the Wednesday session. Um, so uh, yeah, let me just get it. Oh, okay. Look, TensorFlow versus PyTorch. Uh, I uh, we try. I think the first time I taught this course, which was 2017, we used TensorFlow, but we switched to PyTorch. Uh, we, um, you know, I just feel okay. So let me get jump ahead a bit to the PyTorch. So this uh, this this three A uh, gives you an introduction to PyTorch. Oh, that's the other thing. For this course, we assume that you've got some familiarity with Python. Yeah, if you're a bit rusty with Python, you may like to um, brush up a bit. We've we've tried to provide a little bit of a Python refresher here in, in this week zero material. Have a look at that or some other Python resources if you want. But uh, this this is just uh, really focusing on PyTorch. And basically, we feel that uh, the we feel that PyTorch makes it easy to understand what's really going on. I mean, it's got this very nice. Um, Um, framework here where you zero the gradients, you back propagate and then you step the optimizer and uh, in certain situations, you know, I explain here in certain situations, you may need to retain the graph or detach it. So we just find that this model for when you're learning the material is much easier to understand than uh, TensorFlow, and that's why we stick to PyTorch. If you're familiar with TensorFlow already, you should be able to learn PyTorch pretty easy. You should be able to migrate to PyTorch pretty easily because the two things are quite similar. And conversely, if you do learn PyTorch and then later you need to use TensorFlow, you should be able to pick it up pretty quickly. So it's just, and same thing with Keras. So the things are quite similar. Uh, but we do feel uh, a bit happier with PyTorch. So I'm afraid you have to learn PyTorch. Uh, now, someone's asking about Jupyter. Yeah, so sorry, I should mention that. So this 
his coding exercises. Uh, so some of these, um, so some of you may have taken courses in the past where you can run, um, where you can run the Python in the in the browser. So some of these things are so simple. Some of these things are fairly small scale and it's possible to just run them in the browser. You just click the run button. Uh, but um, they, pretty soon we get to things where uh, it's kind of not feasible to run things in the browser, either because the relevant libraries are not available or the size of the computation is too big. Uh, sorry, let me have a look here. Oh, you, sorry, I haven't. Uh, where are we? Yeah, so anyway, uh, so for when we get on to those later exercises, we recommend that you download the Jupyter Notebook, run it locally on your machine, rather than trying to do it through the browser. So these, uh, right, you might need to resize the window. So at the moment, I can only see a few menu items, but if I resize the window enough, eventually these two other menus appear, save and commands. And if I click on commands, and scroll down, I can click download notebook, right? So uh, that's what you should be doing, like resize the window to get to the commands menu, download the notebook, and then um, work locally with, um, once you've downloaded, you can work locally with Jupyter on your own machine. Or, I mean, if you don't like Jupyter and you prefer to just edit the files directly, you know, you can you can copy and paste into a file and edit it and do whatever you want. But, you know, you should have no trouble running this locally with, with Jupyter. I, where were we? So we didn't see if there was anything else. Oh, sorry, you were, sorry. Sorry, Wade Year was asking about the assignment. Oh, for the assignment, you're supposed to submit, uh, you're supposed to submit just the text. Is, for this assignment, you, you're supposed to, when you submit code, you're supposed to submit just text files, something.py, not a note, not in the form of a notebook, but just in the form of individual text files. If you want to use uh, Jupyter to do your development and then copy them into text files, that's fine. If you want to use Eclipse or some other IDE, that's fine too. But yeah, we just try to make it simple so that everyone can submit in the same format. Uh, someone's asking about the exercise 1A. Uh, yes, I mean, when I say use your knowledge of plane geometry, <laughs> this is just sort of high, I'm just talking about high school geometry in two dimensions. Yeah, so exactly the same. Uh, where is it? What we've done here. So I think in this video, I, so this this shows you how to do this. We've done this with and and or. So this is what I'm asking you to do, just draw a line uh, that separates the points and then figure out the uh equation of that line from the slope and the intercept and then turn it into an inequality um i uh, someone was asking about xor yeah so this xor is the simplest example of a 
non-linearly separable function, there's no, there's no way you can draw a line such that the two black dots are on one side of the line and the two white dots are on the other. Ah, uh, settings profile, I see. Ah, uh, sorry, Henry's asking about the learning rate. Yeah, I think I sort of mentioned this before. When we get to backpropagation, the learning rate makes a big difference, but for perceptron learning, it doesn't really matter what learning rate you use. The algorithm takes approximately the same number of steps to converge. So we use a learning rate of one just because it's simpler to do the equations, but we could have used you know, 0 0.1 and we get the same result. Good. Any other questions? Ah, uh, oh, yes. Okay. A, B. <laughs> so it's something not linearly separable. Does this just mean that you need more than one perceptron to handle it? Oh, no. This, well, this two separate issues here. Okay. Let me just pick up on this. Ah, uh, so. When we say more than one perceptron, so first of all, um, I was mentioning here that we'd have 26 perceptrons, uh, but each, each perceptron computes something linearly separable. So if we have multiple categories and we say that it's linearly separable what we really what we normally mean by that is that each category is linearly separable from the others but with the non-linearly separable ones we're com oh yes i mean this is getting into tomorrow's material but we're actually going to be combining perceptrons in a different way by putting them on top of each other um, but when I say that a two layer, I guess I should mention this. So this exercise shows that you can design a two layer neural network by hand if you know the logical function to begin with. But normally we don't know a logical function. We just know a bunch of data. And if you've just got a bunch of data, two layers, a two layer network might not be enough to learn that data. So that's how the course is gonna progress. We start out with one layer and then we go to two, two layers and three layers. And then when we get to week four, we'll be looking at how to do eight layers, 10 layers, 20 layers. Yeah, the special techniques we need for um, multiple layers. Ah, uh, <laughs> Henry's asked about overfitting. Um, look, I don't, I, I really, I'm trying to, um, it's good that some of you are reading ahead in the material and looking at next week and the week after. Um, but uh, I, I, I try to uh, focus each session on the material for that session. I will sometimes jump ahead uh, to make a particular point, but it's probably better if we talk next week about the overfitting. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the recording, it may take, uh, in some cases, I, this is being recorded. In, I'll, uh, when the recording's ready, I'll post it on Ed. Um, this one I'll try to get up this evening. Uh, it, as the course progresses, there may be cases where it might take a few days. Uh, for the recording to appear, but I'll try to get them up as soon as I can.
Good. Any final questions? <laughs> ah, commercial uses for neural networks. Let me have a look. Well, uh, so the question was about uses for neural networks. So the way I've tried to structure this course is as follows. So the first three weeks are kind of uh, general material. And then after that, we kind of focus on one class of application at a time. So week four, we focus on image processing. Uh, weeks five to seven, we focus on sequence and language processing, then reinforcement learning, and finally, like um, unsupervised learning and image generation. So, this is a lot of the kind of thing that neural networks are being used for image processing and um, language, English process, image processing, language processing, and reinforcement reinforcement learning and um, image and text generation. Those are probably the main applications, but then there's quite a few um, others, I guess. Um, yeah, so within image processing, there's object, I, we'll probably focus on image classification, but there's also like, where you're given an image and you're trying to decide, say what kind of object is in the image, but there's also like uh, image um, segmentation where you're given an image and you're trying to identify multiple objects and put a bounding box around each object or, or an outline. Uh, there's, uh, yeah, we're gonna look a bit at style transfer where you take, the style of image and from one image and combined with the content from another image. And then with language processing, so there's language generation, there's question answering, uh, there's uh, chat bots, there are tasks which combine images and language, you know, like you're given an image and you try to generate a caption for that image, or you, you're given a caption and you try to generate an image for that caption. Um, and then with the reinforcement learning, we may, you know, there's like a lot of this is focused on video games, but it can also be applied to uh, resource allocation and various other kind of real world problems. And the unsupervised learning is, um, I guess a lot of it is to do with generation. Yeah, like image generation or text generation. Also semi-supervised learning. Sometimes you've got tons and tons of data, but only like a tiny fraction of it is labeled. So you can use semi-supervised learning to make use of both the unlabeled data and the, and the labels that you have. Um, yeah, so it's quite a big field these days. Yeah, and then with, even with images, you got applications, satellite images, medical images, sonar images. <laughs> it's, um, there's so many different things. So as we had computer vision, we try to keep, there's this whole separate course on computer vision we try to keep these two courses, we try to keep the overlap minimal, uh, but of course, there's obviously gonna be some, some overlap there. Good. <laughs> Anything else? Okay, well, I'll see you tomorrow at 6 p.m. Yeah.